Good. How's my hair? Oh, perfect. perfect. Okay. We're ready. We are. Welcome everyone to today's Cisco Chat Live. I'm Sylvia Spiva, Cisco Developer Community Manager, and you know we always bring you all the latest news from DevNet. We want to make sure that you know the latest, and the latest is DevNet Automation Exchange. We have a great crew with us. We're going to go first to hear from Patrick. I'm Patrick Rockholtz. Uh, I've been uh, at Cisco for about four years as a, as a systems engineer in the Atlanta Select uh, commercial space. And before that, on the customer side, as a sales engineer and network engineer in the service provider arena. Hey, everybody. I'm Bill Henschel. I'm the uh, director of enterprise networks for our America's partner organization. And uh, as a 19-year Cisco veteran and coder myself, I'm excited to discuss what's going on with partners in DevNet. And I'm John McDonough. I'm a DevNet developer advocate. I've been with Cisco for quite a number of years, and I've been programming all those years. And I'm excited about this new uh, network automation exchange that we have. So, of course, you get the tough question. Sure. What is DevNet Automation Exchange? So DevNet Automation Exchange is a place where you can um, get some use cases and code that could help you in your automation, um, in your automation journey. And that's great, but it's also a place where you can submit or give what you've done. And I know that as a developer, every time I do something great <laughs> or something good, I like to share it. And not, not, not from a you know, pat on the back perspective, but I think if it's helped me it can help somebody else. So um, Automation Exchange is a place where you can get some use cases and the code and how it was deployed and things like that. But it's also a place where you can submit what you've done and tell us how you did it. You know, give yourself a little bit of um, a place to shine and tell us all about um, your automation and what you're doing in your environment and share with others. You've been with DevNet for two, three years now? Coming up on three years, yeah, yeah. But of course, you were presenting in the DevNet zone before that. Oh my gosh, I um, I was in another group and I saw the great stuff going on in DevNet. And I thought, if I start presenting in the DevNet zone, maybe they'll be like, "Hey, I like that guy," and and they'll they'll bring him in uh, or bring me in. And uh, so I, I started way back to um, presenting in the DevNet zone. But now um, I'm actually a DevNet developer advocate for data center and you know network automation, data center automation. These are things that I spent a lot of time looking at and working on. And that's why I'm so excited about this automation exchange because it gives me a place to share what I'm doing. So hold on to that feeling of remembering what it was like to want to be part of DevNet mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that everyone watching feels welcome and that they understand how they can contribute. Sure. Let's go to someone representing one of our favorite organizations. Patrick, tell us about, um, uh, today you're representing the systems engineering organization. Who can contribute? to automation exchange? So the really, really short answer is anyone. Um, but as far in terms of our SE leadership and how they've kind of approached this, really, especially with uh, Chris Lunsford, and he has, uh, has really been an advocate for this and really helped our engineering team kind of move the needle in terms of the, the coding and, and programming fundamentals that uh, we as SEs, as well as the community as a whole, um, need and desire. Uh, Chris and I actually just finished a DevNet workshop um, for local network, some local network academy students, went through the fundamentals around Python and APIs, and DevNet has done a lot of those kinds of events, not only local to areas like Atlanta, but worldwide, just in terms of uh, looking at some of the different architectures with DevNet Express events, with the workshops, there's been hackathons and other ways just to get the training and hands-on uh, so that they can really see what we're doing in terms of making an open, agile approach to, um, to automation. And one of the questions that we as SEs often ask even our customers is, what problem are we trying to solve? And normally I break that down into kind of three pressures that a lot of IT and networking teams have. One is that external IT pressure, right? Where Cisco and other vendors uh, continue to introduce new features and functionality that a lot of these teams just currently don't have the bandwidth to, to take advantage of because they're putting out fires all the time, 
trying to manage these networks that are becoming more and more complex. Another one is in terms of sort of this internal IT pressure where just internally there's more and more mobile devices, more and more IoT devices that are being added to the network. Again, adding to that complexity as well as security um, concerns. And the third is a business pressure where the lines of business are really seeing how important the network is to helping you know, with the customer experience. Like um, one example, even locally to Atlanta is a, a furniture company that uses location analytics to determine how long a customer has been in a store, what they're looking at, they need help or not, or if it's in terms of saving money, like another company that uses a, a freezer refrigeration warehouse system where they need to know these temperatures are critical to the business. And instead of using humans that obviously are, can be more error prone, they need to get that data reliably through automation as well as to act on it in case there's issues. So that's kind of the idea is how can we help with these pressures? Uh, and I, I, I see just from, you know, outside looking into DevNet, um, really DevNet started with that code exchange, right? The ability to kind of curate code from GitHub and, and not have to use Google, kind of bringing that code into a place where they can look at it and start to see some of those examples. But as to your point, um, this network automation exchange is kind of the next step into those real world use cases where the community can kind of see how they can drive the innovation, uh, not only from those examples, but using those examples to even bring them back and represent them to the community, to the codex, to the automation exchange to, to continue the, the efforts there. Those are some great examples. And uh, if I go to automation exchange, will I see those use cases there? Or do we want to really take the opportunity to remind people to enter those use cases and shine and share? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great point too. I mean, the use cases that are there is kind of, a, I would say, a starting point. And maybe the use case doesn't, maybe it's not 100% of what you're looking for, maybe it's 80%. You can take that example, add to it, and then sort of resubmit that to, to as a use case also. So that helps other people as well. Now, we know that Cisco loves our partners. We love our partners, that's a hashtag. I didn't start it, my friend Mo Abdel started it, but you know, he's, He's fantastic. So a shout out to Mo Abdel. And we're going to go to someone else um, who is fantastic and loves our partners, our friend Bill. And we're going to ask Bill why he's so involved with DevNet and why he sees DevNet as being so important for Cisco partners. Uh, it's a great question, Sylvia. You know, one of the things in, in my time covering our partner community uh, and, and dealing with partners globally in my former role is that they're always looking for a way to differentiate themselves. You know, anybody can sell you a switch or router or whatever from, from us or any manufacturer, quite frankly, but what is the thing that makes that partner unique? How do they stand out in a crowd? And, and as I did at Cisco Live US, one of the conversations that came up time and time again is how do I stand out? How do I leverage the great stuff we do and the intellectual property? You know, it's not just install some net ops hardware faster or better, but really how do I start doing things like writing automation code that either is gonna help me be more profitable because I can do a deployment for a customer faster and, and in, in a consistent way that helps my security, or um, is there something I could do, something unique that I can do with, with a, uh, a network that I couldn't do before with just simple you know, CLI, et cetera. And when we have these discussions, it's been awesome when I talk to these partners and I've had, I had multiple, you know, like I had one I was talking to and they said, hey, you know, we kind of have this DevOps practice that's really focused on collaboration. And now I'm learning about DevNet and all the open APIs you have across your entire portfolio. I, boy, it seems like there's a lot more we could do there. And we started talking about it and how um, on average, partners find that they are about three times more profitable by doing DevOps types practices than they are doing just simple NetOps, you know, rack and stack install kind of stuff. So the, the profitability came in and then obviously then differentiation. You know, wow, if I could do something amazing like write an app that watches for uh, like when a badge reader triggers and then the camera sees that trigger and, I, and matches that person's face with the badge read, wow, that would be amazing to have an automated like security system. Ironically, if you look up on the automation exchange, there's already one up there for Meraki cameras and badge readers. 
So I was like, wow, that was funny. They were just talking about it. And now I see someone's already uploaded that example. And that's just one idea. So things like that, now you can really differentiate and, and leverage the network in, in new, unique ways that allow you as a partner to say, hey, you want to come work with me, partner ABC, because I have this capability and context. The other part that's really cool about that is our, is our partners start getting more and more involved in this global community is that it, it lets them shine and see why do I want to select if I'm a customer? Why do I want to select this partner? Wow, look at this. They've got all this code uploaded. They actually understand networking beyond just simple connections, but actually how to articulate the network based on some really biz, you know, real business use case. And, and that ties right into some of those certifications that we're having coming out here shortly around uh, DevNet. So it's not just I'm a CCIE, but I'm like a rock star developer and I can showcase my talent. So why do I as an individual, you know, what's the value I have, but also as a partner, what value does this partner have and why would I pick partner A over partner B? Because I might be able to get a better experience with that partner. And, and then, you know, th then it really, it just really grows from there. So it, my point simply is, if I bring this back is, being able to leverage the open APIs and the platform experience that we give that I blogged about allows partners to really change the game for themselves and stand out. And, and it's core to their business and, and how they're going to go to the next, you know, go to the next wave. So that's that's really why DevNet and tying in these communities and this automation exchange is the, is the you know, the new thing that we're adding really helps them change their business and, and go to that next, you know, what the next years are going to look like. I like that you gave an example that's already an automation exchange. And I want to remind the global community, it's not about, oh, someone had that idea already. I wasn't the first one to get that idea in. That's not what matters. What matters is building on each other's ideas, right? Because we can take it to the next level. And, and that's what this is all about share what you've built and you'll be surprised at how you can uh, collaborate, not just with people within Cisco, but with other partners. Now, Bill, I wanna come back to a point that you made, which is really important. And I wanna make sure that people hear it. Partners, Cisco partners who have a DevOps practice tend to be three times more profitable. Tell us yeah, more about that. You know so I got that. I was talking to, to uh, a partner that's actually developed uh, a really nice DevOps practice. In fact, uh, you know, I know we're not doing product placement, but I've got a little Panera cup here, and that's the customer they wrote for. Um, and, 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 and it's a public reference, so I'm allowed to do that. But the, what, what's cool about it is uh, this partner was telling me that, that, you know, it wasn't just setting up the network, but then they used their DevOps practice that they built out and invested in to then expand what, what that company was able to do. And when I talked to them about it, I said, wow, you know, how did this change your business? And they said, well, you know, Bill, selling hardware, I get, I get, you know, a certain amount of profitability off selling your hardware. When I attach my services to it, for every dollar of service, I get about $3 uh, I've sold about three dollars of hardware to get the same level of profitability when I sell, attach my services. When I attach my DevOps practice and and actually start coding, not only do I get more stickiness with that customer and allow them to do net new things and change their business model, but I get about a nine x over just selling the hardware. So I sell you a piece of gear, I make one x profit. If I can sell you some DevOps practice and coding capabilities, I make about nine x. So it's about a three a factor of three times more profitable than their traditional services sales model. So that was that's a direct quote from one partner. I mean, your mileage is going to vary, of course, of course, but um, but that that was I was like, wow, that's there it is. That's why you should do this. So I'm going to give any Cisco partner watching out there some homework. Go to blogs.cisco.com slash author slash Bill Henschel because he has been blogging about this in the past year and you want to go back, do your homework and get these step-by-step -step tips on how to build a DevOps practice from Bill. But I know he's going to be blogging a lot more, so make sure you bookmark that. blogs.cisco.com slash developer slash author slash Bill Henschel. Um, we have lot, some questions coming in already. I have to ask this one. Some will say for the end, um, because it means that someone we care about a lot is paying attention. Question from Stuart Clark on YouTube. Who has the best, most awesome beard on the DevNet team? Oh my gosh, um, that would be me. And um, 
<laughs> Sorry, Stuart. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if my if mine actually counts as a beard, but I, I would say that uh, when you have this, um, you know, the darker on the top and the more, uh, you know, mature on the bottom, it just lends itself to a, a brand of awesomeness that you can't get with a one color beard <laughs> or uh, a length of beard. So I'm going to say from that perspective, it, it would be me. But uh, everybody's opinion is uh, is different. And, um, you know, well, I, I just have to you know we can agree to disagree, perhaps. Maybe you don't have the most awesome big evil beard in the DevNet team, but a big shout out to our teammates who are manning and womaning the social media channels out there. We're live on Cisco.com, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. So thank you everyone for tuning in and make sure you keep sending us your questions and we will get to them before the end. Automation exchange. I know you've heard about code exchange. You've heard about partner exchange. This is really that next step of bringing all of that together, learning from somebody else's use cases and adding your own use cases, automation exchange. So what is it? How do you submit a use case step by step? John, can you show us how to use it? I can. So let me just set this up uh, for just a minute. You know, my favorite part of going to the movies is the previews. Oh. And, um, you know, you see what's coming, what you're excited about, what you think is, is um, you know, junk. So, you you know, you just, <laughs> you just, you know, and then you make little quips to your, uh, to whoever you're there with. But here's the thing. Um, we uh, have a full-length movie coming at some point, but the uh, I did bring a clip with me today. Okay. Uh, the control room has it, so if the code, if you in the, up in the control room, if you would actually roll the clip, we can uh, go ahead and I'll take you through uh, the submission process. Please. So, and if I could, I'd like to change my answer. It is Stuart. He has the best beard. Um, so you open up a browser and go to developer.cisco.com/automation. It's really that simple. And when you get to the automation page, you'll see that we have two buttons right at the top. One to view all the use cases, which that's your homework, do it on your own. And then share a use case. That's what I want to talk about today. You click that button, it takes you to the uh, case submission form or the use case submission form. You put in a title. And in this case, the title is Ansible Playbooks for Configuring UCS Network Interfaces and VLANs. Give me a two line technology summary or put a two line technology summary in the form and go ahead and add a two line business summary. Why did you do this? How does it help your business? How does it help your day to day? And now give us a really detailed use case description, as detailed as you can possibly be, because we're going to use this to determine, um, you know, uh, addition into the into the uh, automation exchange, and also so the people using it, you know, know what, what it is all about. So, what's the use case for this one? Automation at scale. I want to be able to add these interfaces quickly. Pick the domain. Well, it's data center, and but you could pick others. So suppose it was, uh, um, you know, it was beyond that. What's the workflow? This is day one configuration or day two configuration, perhaps. What are the products that are being used here? I guess this one's for UCS, but it could be ACI, it could be NXOS. And what's the stage? Is it walk, run, and fly? Is it run? Is it fly? Whatever it may be. And list the technologies used. So in this case, it was Ansible. And they give us some more information. The link to the code exchange uh, repo, the name of a sandbox, the link to a sandbox, anything here that can help somebody with this use case. A video demo, a video tutorial. And once all that's in there, click submit. We get your submission. We go through it. We look at the, the repo and code exchange. We look at uh, the detail that you've given us. And we determine the viability of putting this out there in automation exchange. It's really that simple. So there is a check checking process that happens in the background after a submission is made. Absolutely. You know, we don't just um, click submit and then it's just out there. Okay. It's uh, click submit. Our teams get notified. We look at this. And so from a domain perspective, if one, you know, I, I did that uh, little clip there. So, of course, I put UCS and that's my favorite technology. Um, but now I'm the domain expert on that. But some other domain experts will be pulled in for the technologies that are utilized there. And, you know, we may actually go ahead and run through that code just to ensure, is this doing what they said it would do? Uh, we'll look at the code. You know, we'll make sure the licensing is correct. So there's a lot of things that come into play to make sure that uh, it really does fit into that, um, you know, that section of, of DevNet uh, and it's appropriately uh, or it's appropriate to be out there. 
Well, that's good to know. So any use cases that are already there on Automation Exchange have gone through that process? Any use cases that are out there, we, we went over, we looked at code, we um, ensured that the licensing was correct, we ensured that uh, this was something that people could download and utilize, and the providers of that, you know, are, are rest assured that, you know, someone's using their code, but we do want to make sure that people understand when you bring something into your environment, you know, test it first to make sure it works for you the way it should work, or you expect it to work, you know, we, we do expect you to, you know, make sure it's good for you um, and uh, follow your best practices within your environment when you apply code like that. This is super exciting because you know, you and I have been on the DevNet team for uh, almost three years now, and we've been following DevNet like we were talking about earlier before, and we see that there are so many people that are involved and have so much to contribute. So this is an opportunity for them to submit their use cases and really get visibility for themselves, for their organization, for their company. Tell us more about walk, run, fly. What does that mean? So, of, of course, you know, and, and just, you know, a little bit on your last point there was that, uh, you know, people used to come to these events and be like, oh, I really want to be part of DevNet. I really want to do what you do. I want to get out there and talk, and I want to get, and I want to write a blog. And, and now, you know, this is how we can bring that community in, wherever you are. You may never get to go to an event because of your location, because of the whatever the resources are that you have. But if you're that developer, if you're that person, and you're, in that scenario where you can't make it to us, right? That doesn't mean you can't be part of us. This is how you can be part of us. This is for everybody everywhere globally. So walk, run, fly. Well, you know, we know everybody can't be as seasoned as everybody else because it takes years to get there, experience, et cetera. And how do you do it, right? You walk, well, you might've crawled first, but uh, <laughs> you walk, and then you run and then you fly. And the walking part is let's get some data and analytics from our environments. Let's just query it. Don't do anything that might change configurations or let's walk, get some data and pull it out. That's the walk part. The run part is, okay, well now I got my data and maybe I'm gonna do some, some uh, coding here to let me change some configurations, right? In, maybe a hands-on way, maybe at the command line, I still run a script, but I have control over when that's running and, and I can see how it kind of plays out and it does this uh, configuration for me based on some data that it pulled. So we're putting that walk and that run together. And fly is really where it all comes together. This is the exciting part because now we can take the uh, automation code that's there and put it into our DevOps, um, our DevOps practices, right? So where I can make a change to maybe a configuration in an editor, push that change to a code repository. Mm -hmm. So I have it documented. I made the change when I did it, and I pushed it to the code repository. Well, now the code repository typically has some kind of webhook that can be triggered, and this is what's exciting. So now the code repository says, oh, you made a change sends off this webhook, which may be the payload of that webhook is what changed, who changed it, when it was changed, and it sends it off to a webhook listener, whatever that may be, whether it's something in the cloud or it's something on, on a workstation someplace in your data center. This webhook gets, or this payload gets delivered to the webhook listener. The webhook listener parses it, pulls out the data, and says, oh, it's an update um, was made to this playbook the configuration was changed or we're adding something, whatever it may be, I'm going to run it. And as exciting as that is, right, from push to your code repository to the code being run and changing your, your, uh, your environment, the logs and, and whatever may be uh, resulting from that change, well, they're on that workstation. How about I take those logs, mm -hmm. right? You ready for this? All right. I take those logs and I send it to a collaboration um, you know, endpoint where everybody in my team sees the change that just happened. Who did it, when they did it, what the results were, and now I have an historical record of all that. The changes, the people get to see it, that's the fly. It's end-to-end -end DevOps enabled automation and that's what we're talking about. And Start slow, not slow, easy. Start better, best. It really seems like a journey towards community, which which is fantastic. You know, you, you feel, at first you might feel like, oh, I'm doing this on my own. I wonder if anyone out there is noticing. Then you have something worth sharing and then you're improving 
mm -hmm. the experience for everybody. I love that we always bring it back to community. And thank you for explaining that. Now, I know Susie has presented on this topic before, a walk, run, fly. And we have videos uh, from DevNet Create and Cisco Live US. So um, Social Julio at Social Julio, Julio Fernandez, who's monitoring your questions, reminded me to remind you to go to the DevNet YouTube channel and watch those videos and get trained. And you can always go to developer.cisco.com and see the complete list of um, places where you can follow us on social and you can make at Social Julio happy. Now, Walk, run, fly. I want to know how partners are doing this. I want to know how our systems engineers are, are doing this. So, Bill, how are you getting the word out to Cisco partners about everything that they can do with DevNet? That's a, 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 a nice one, Sylvia. So that, that's, that's a big question. A lot going on there. Um, because there's so many parts of DevNet, right? And so the, the first thing that I have done is when I meet with the partners, as I go and I check in with them and find out things like, do you even have a DevNet practice or DevOps practice, I should say? And uh, if you do, have you marketed it? Are you aware of it? And if not, are there things that we can do with our connection to DevNet to help you market and, and take advantage of it? And so that's the first part of just the introduction is just having those face-to-face -face meetings and talking about what their strategy is around DevOps and how they're interfacing and being part of the DevNet community can expand what they're doing already. I, as I've said before, I found some of these partners maybe have a DevOps practice, but it's limited to a certain area. You know, well, we only do it when we're talking into Azure or AWS. We hadn't even thought about some of the things we could do on the network. And then tying it back to, wow, you know what, if you thought about this more broadly as you're bringing applications down from, let's say, AWS, to having the network automatically identify and apply policy to make sure you're getting proper access and, and throughput and quality of service, et cetera, could then extend that out. And then, oh, my God, I didn't even think about that. So that's, that's one area. The other area is just doing things like going to Cisco Live and, and encouraging our partners and sending messages to our partners to make sure they're showing up at all the DevNet uh, events going on at, whether it was Cisco Live US or the upcoming one in Cancun at Cisco Live LATAM, which I hope to see a lot of you there. And, and I know that'll be a great time, but that's another area where we make sure they're aware of this opportunity to be part of this bigger community. And then the third thing that I, I've been focusing on in my uh, role is we do, Cisco does a lot of investments in our partners because you said at the beginning, partners are so critical to our business. And with over 10,000 partners spread across the Americas to make sure we're touching them and make sure we're investing, is that we write contracts with them, uh, investment contracts that say, hey, if you go build out your DevOps practice, we'll help you. And so for partners that are really digging in and really want to co-invest and don't really know how to get going, we have people on my team that are going in and actually helping them through through investments of people and dollars and connecting them back to, to DevNet so that they can see what the opportunity is beyond what's going on, right? As I talked about a minute ago about the, you know, trying to increase profitability so much for them, I mean, that's huge for them. So that's those are different ways that we're getting the message out. And then, of course, making sure everybody in America's partner organization is aware of the opportunity that DevNet provides for our partners and how they can get involved. It, it's, it's really the next wave. You even see our senior leaders. We're going to impact, as you know, here coming up the end of, uh, end of August, which is our big sales event. We have everybody from around the globe all comes into Las Vegas, and we share best practices and ideas. We talk about the fiscal year we ended and what the big focus is for next year. Well, guess what? DevNet, DevOps practices, all the open APIs, that's a huge focus of this coming impact. And we're going to be talking about that. We have a lot of partners that show up and, and want to hear what's the latest, where we focus, what's the top of mind for Cisco. And as you mentioned already, Sylvia and John, is Susie, this is huge top of mind for Susie and Chuck. It's going to be all over our impact. So I think that's just going to help spread the word even more on top of what little old me can do. But keep spreading the word, and we are admiring your stickers. Look at all the stickers. He, he has Devi. He has a Barcelona Devi. He has a little Come to the Community Devi. He has a Sylvia sticker. He's a team player. Yeah, we're liking that. There's, there's a Julio sticker over here, too. Don't Let's not forget all the swag, you know. I got that, and then I've got, you know, even on the back of the phone. I'm a little bit of a fanboy, a little bit. 
every sticker counts and we appreciate it. We want people to, you know, reskill themselves, to learn new skills. Now we rely heavily on our systems engineers. So we're gonna go back to Patrick and ask him, how do you and everyone in your organization make the time to learn these new skills? Because we're relying on you, but how do you stay up to date with everything that's coming at you from DevNet and from the community at large? Uh, great question. You really do have to find the time to really, you have to make time to get these new skills. and. and it is, uh, as other videos you've had, kind of ask the question around developer, engineer. It really is that hybrid approach to being a developer and an engineer, taking both of those skill sets and, um, and honing them, right? So you've got a lot of guys out there that are definitely um, heavily certified in, in the network realm and, and bringing their software skills up to speed. Uh, there will be a, a rare breed indeed, at least especially right now, and how important it's going to be to continue that, that path. Um, we said it before, so it's maybe a little cliche at this point, but definitely the developer.cisco.com page. And right there in the front, I think this was introduced right before Cisco Live San Diego, but you got those nice little getting started. It was like six circles there. And the far left is that start now. And, and we talked a lot about this uh, when we were at Cisco Live in San Diego. They, they kind of introduced this kind of getting started section in the DevNet zone. And it's just a great place to, to find how to get started, the coding one-on-one -on -one skills we talked about, the fundamentals around Python, the fundamentals around what APIs are and how, how they're used. You've got learning tracks there as well on, the, on that front page where you can go in and, and kind of pick a path and there's different modules within that path that can kind of help you um, move on uh, depending on what architecture you want to explore. There's a video course there also um, presented by Hank Preston who does another great job just kind of building those foundations. And of course, there's the sandboxes where you can go in uh, and basically turn up uh, some, some equipment that you might need, whether it's uh, routing devices or other collaboration devices, security, all those pieces are there to spin up and, and start to play and start to get to know and, and get comfortable with, with the programmability around those pieces. And of course, now we have uh, the network automation exchange as well. So I'd say beyond that, um, beyond jumping into the start now part is, is also maybe just get a study partner, someone that you can get with daily to kind of push you along. Um, Stuart is, uh, Clark has kind of been mine, not only has he helped me with my beard, but also just in terms of the next level as far as, um, you know, Python, just to kind of exploring different um, places we're going to, hey, I, I found this, you know, kind of, you may want to try this. There's some different books around how to kind of bring your skills to the next level as well. So that's that's been helpful. And also whether you're going to Cisco Live or you're internal to Cisco and you're going to Impact, Definitely go by the DevNet zone there and just and just spend time there and, and kind of soak in some of the knowledge and then obviously take that knowledge and do the hands-on. That's that's how I learn, is just doing the hands-on, continuing to practice and seeing the results and, and find out if there's especially if there's errors, right? Never be afraid of, of doing something wrong because that's against how you learn, how you troubleshoot, uh, how you get comfortable with those pieces. We always have to keep learning. We always have to keep working at getting better at what we do and what we love to do. Now, I know all three of you are going to want to answer these questions that are coming in. It's, it's around uh, the same topic, DevNet certifications. Who wants to go first? Bill, I know you wanted to talk about DevNet certifications. You want to go first? Sure. What's the questions about DevNet certification, Sylvia? How will it help my career? How, uh, when will they be ready? I can say that that's coming uh, later in 2020, actually. Um, why should I look into DevNet certifications? So we're getting a lot of questions around DevNet certifications. Awesome. Well, you know, I mean, uh, obviously I can look at this two ways. One is through the partner lens, the area that I'm, I specialize in, and that's, um, again, I, I mentioned before, how do I differentiate myself as a partner? So, you know, Cisco, our bread and butter is our certifications. Early in the days when people started reselling Cisco product, one of the big things that helped them differentiate themselves was our traditional certifications, our CCNA, NP, CCIE being the, you know, the flagship certification across the tech industry. And that brings a level of credibility to any individual, whether they be working for a partner or, or out on their own or working at a customer, you know, that, that is one of the most sought after certifications because it demonstrates a level of competence and capability at the expert level. You know, if you have somebody with that certification, you have an expected outcome. 
Well, on the DevNet side, now having similar certifications that have those stages where you've got like the basic, the intermediate and the advanced versions that are coming out, you can demonstrate to whether it be your employer, your partner, or to other individuals that you have a level of skill and competence in being able to leverage the, the APIs across all of Cisco's products and you're able to create net new things. You know, you, you tie that in a certification with something like the automation exchange where you can show that you're a, a contributor. You know, it's the same way, like if you think of GitHub where you go on there and you can see if you're contributing and you're, you're in there and adding on, as John highlighted, you know, we've got, you've got a, a base thing and then now you've added on and extended even further. Those are areas that can highlight your skill as either a partner community or as an individual. And ideally those go hand in hand. So both the certifications that are coming up and leveraging these platforms and all these different code exchanges that we're now offering in DevNet is a way to, to really highlight the value of you. And a certification path, I mean, like I said before, that's, that's really the, the bread and butter of Cisco and how you can show that and demonstrate that. So if a customer gets engaged with a partner and you say, hey, I've got five DevNet experts certified on there, wow, then I know that you're probably somebody I wanna do business with versus, yeah, I do some coding, right? So I, I think that, that it, it shows a lot of that. And I think just like CCIE does, I have a feeling don't know, but I have a feeling the long run, when it comes to things like salary, which we all care about, having a certification like that shows that, that you have that capability and you can probably uh, demand a little bit higher salary. So I think there's some per personal and family gratification there too. Patrick, John, anything you wanna to add to that? To the certifications, I would just say that, um, you know, for the DevNet associate, that is really going to, like Bill said, uh, give that person, you know, the confidence, you know, they pass that test. It gives them the confidence to be able to say, yeah, I understand programmability. Yeah, this is something that I can do and do for you. When you get to the DevNet uh, professional level or the specialist and you've concentrated in an area, well, now, you know, it's not just programmability that you know, but I know this area or these areas. So we're really helping people quantify their capabilities so that when they do go out, um, whether it's a job that they're looking for or a job that they already have, they say, it's not just me saying I can do this. Cisco said, I know how to do this. And that's what's really important about the certifications. That's very powerful. And I wanna ask more about how do you choose an area to specialize in? I mean, you're our data center expert, we know that. Patrick, um, I want to take it back to you. How do you choose what you want to specialize in? And can you change once you've made that choice? How hard is it to change? I don't, I mean, to answer the first, uh, the second part first, I don't think it's hard to change um, at all if you specialize. And, and what's nice about the way that the certifications are now being presented, especially from, you know, the CCNP level, right, is that you can, if you're in your, whatever you're doing in the IT you know, in your company, and you're really focused on one piece very heavily, you can go ahead and get that specialist. You can go ahead and get that CCMP around that uh, specialty certification. And then if you, you can explore other pieces as well, right? So you can go into other special specialties as well. So I think it's, it's very flexible. You can kind of make your own career path around certifications. And to John's point as well is that uh, I'll add to that and, and that we're, we're seeing this, the automation piece go into both directions, right? We're definitely seeing it in the CCMP. We're gonna see it in CCIE. It's already in, you know, DevNet Associates, it's already in DevNet Professional. All of this is going across um, all the all the certification portfolio. To learn, auto, to, the, to learn this automation, to learn how to program is the way networks are going to be built. They have to be built, like I said before, given the speed of how things are moving, the speed of the business. Um, yeah, again, these, these pressures that IT teams are feeling, we have to be able to do this in a manner that is, is automated. And so I think you're seeing that presented across all the certifications because of that. Well, can, yes. well, I was just saying, can I add one more thing about this? Sure. Whether it's Bill or Patrick or myself, you know, we can't answer all the questions about certifications just off the top of our head especially for DevNet, um, because they're so new. And, and these things are, um, are, you know, the information that's out there um, is 
you know, more than I think one person, you know, in here could just, you know, put out in the, in the time that we have. So if you really want to know about DevNet certifications, developer.cisco.com slash certification. So That's easy it, to it's remember. pretty easy Let's to remember. Developer.cisco.com slash certification. So go. it's very easy to remember. All your answers are there. Not only are your answers there, the way that this part of the of the DevNet site's been set up is that when you're looking at different certifications, we actually give you some links to these labs, to these sandboxes. So get those skills together. And you can start studying now if you're interested in, in going for your DevNet certification, which won't happen until uh, I believe February of 2020. February 2020, that's correct. You can, you can start forming your study groups, studying now, mm -hmm. getting ready, uh, you know, finding people like John on Twitter mm -hmm. to ask questions. We should probably mention Ryan Rose. If anyone's got most of the answers to the DevNet certifications, that's He's Ryan. the one. Ryan is the one, yes. At Ryan Rose. Tell them we sent you. So we also mentioned, uh, too, that Matt Johnson just did a blog post uh, yesterday around the DevNet certifications as well. So just another resource out there, along with Ryan Rose. And if you follow us on Twitter, um, at Cisco DevNet, you will see there uh, that we are having a series of uh, webinars around certification to get you ready for 2020. But today, we wanted to really focus on Automation Exchange. And help me out here. That's developer.cisco.com. Slash automation. automation. <laughs> We try to make it easy to remember. Bill, the last question of the day is for you. And it's a question from David Fernandez, who says, um, well, he says, awesome job, Sylvia, Bill, and Patrick. So thank you, David. And the question is, oh, and John. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, the question is, Partners that believe that they're too small to engage with programmability, what can they do to get started? I get that question a lot. Uh, you know, there's a couple things there. I don't think there is such thing as too small for programmability because programmability is, is an individual thing. So at a minimum, you should have somebody in your staff, Some uh, usually it's an engineer or somebody who has a passion around development um, get involved at at least at a basic level around DevOps and understand some basic things, you know, Ansible, Puppet, uh, Teradata, a few of those things. But if you really want to have like a full on DevOps practice and you feel that you're too small to make that investment, you can't bring a cadre of coders in to go build a bunch of code and get up there. There's a couple of things you can do. Well, you can go look at the automation exchange and go see what codes out there and maybe you can take part of that and if you just have that one person you can add on to it that's one thing you could do another thing you can do is we have a lot of uh we call them dsi partners we have a lot of partners that don't actually resell cisco hardware so they're not competitive to our partners but they specialize in things like a devops practice and you can partner with them so you have a customer that has a unique need you want to use our apis to articulate the network to maybe deliver a different or better application experience, you can partner with other partners that aren't resellers that all they focus on is things like DevOps. And then another thing you can do is uh, there's, there's also, we call it uh, practice as a service. We also have other enablement partners that you can work with that will actually provide those kind of services at, on like a subscription basis. And it does two things. Not only do you get the capacity you need today, but they actually start training individuals in your partner org to become skilled up in that so that then you can offer that as a skill and you can start to build that practice and figure out kind of the same idea of the walk, run, fly. You can start walking and figure out, get your toe in the water, figure out if DevOps is the right thing for your business model. And then if you see that there's good revenue to be made, maybe you start making some investments and you augment it with these uh, services as a service, the DevOps as a service, and then maybe you build out a full practice. Or maybe you decide that's not your model and you just going to continue partnering when it's needed. But, you know, again, I think it's, it's the way to think about it is it's I'm not too small. And I think some of the code you'll see out there 
in the automation exchange or code exchange stuff, you'll see how simple it is. Just grabbing insights. I mean, this is back to that walk concept. Just to be able to grab insights out of the network using code that's already there, you probably can already have a different impact on your end customer because you can see things like from the Rocky dashboard, oh, where, where's everybody at? I can get some in inventory around um, wireless networking and where, where users are, where devices are. Um, you can then move into, well, maybe I'll just add a little automation because it'll help my NetOps practice. Again, you know, there, I'll give you another example. On the automation exchange right now is code you can grab right now that goes to a Nexus and just checks for all the optical connections. So you're racking and stacking, you're wiring up, you're plugging in a bunch of, uh, of fiber ports and you have a problem. Man, if you just grab this code, you can see that port 23 actually maybe you didn't click it in all the way and it's not, or there's a problem on the, on, uh, on the connection and it's not transmitting properly. So just using that little snippet of code, you can already help your business practice, even if it's just more of a net ops, kind of get things configured and set up. And so that's how another way to kind of walk in. So again, there, to me, there is no such thing as I'm too small to DevOps. It's just how you really want to use DevOps. You might be too small to have a full-blown DevOps practice, but that's a business model that we can help work you with. And, and myself and the other leaders in the partner community globally, in, in our global partner organization or regional, in this case, America's partner organization, we're here to help you go on that journey. Just let us know. It sounds like a great invitation. So if you, uh if you've been following Bill, if you've been following this webcast today, you can go back, you can see what his Twitter handle is and make sure that you reach out anytime. We have very social people here. John, you wanted to add something. I did, and, and I thought that, um, and I've thought this for a while. We have developer.cisco.com, and maybe that URL is a little intimidating to people. Why would I go there? I'm not a developer, and so I thought, for those people, I'd like to add, think about that URL as I want to be a developer.cisco.com because that's where you're going to go to learn the basics, to learn the tools. I remember as a, as, you know, a young kid helping my dad fix cars and he would say, hand me that, you know, 716th. And, and the first time out, I didn't know what that was. And he's like, oh, you know, the whatever, it's that one. Well, that's what DevNet is. It's your... Think of it, you're with your dad learning how to fix cars, or maybe you're with your dad learning how to bake a cake, wherever you were with somebody who mentored you through something. I want to be a developer.cisco.com. Wow. That's how you should think about this. And never, ever be intimidated. Our, we don't have you know, egos. We want to help. We want you to succeed. We want you to succeed. What a great thought to give to our community, and thank you both. I want to thank everyone who's helped us be successful today. What a great Cisco chat. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Cisco TV. Thank you, Julio, Diaria, David, Stuart, everyone who asked questions, and um, Patrick, Bill, any final thoughts? Hey, uh, I, I do want to say something. I uh, just want a quick uh, thank you to John McDonough, because it was because of him about two years ago when I first saw his managing Cisco UCS with Amazon Alexa video, it's actually on YouTube if you want to go watch it. But that video really, um, as sort of a, a data center, you know, kind of a little bit of a data center specialist I was, I got to see that. And really that was kind of my point that I took off, um, really wanting to know more about DevNet and how all these pieces, the programmability pieces work together. So I just want to say thank you to John. Wow. That, I, I can't tell you what I'm feeling right now. I'm all like a little tingly because, uh, and not, not in uh, being facetious or silly at all, that is what I want to have happen when I make that video or when I stand up at an event or if I write a blog post, that's what I want. I want wow. someone to say, I want to do that and to know that, that Patrick was inspired by something I did, I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I, I am or gratified I am to hear something like that and, and kudos to you for for uh, putting that effort in. That's great. Wow, I'm feeling the love here. <laughs> <laughs> and John, we'll have to have you back out in Atlanta sometime too for some more UCS programmability. Bill, do you want to thank anyone? Well, I, yeah, wow, several people. 
Actually, um, you know, uh, Sylvia, I want I want to thank you because uh, you and I have been partners in crime for years. I mean, when uh, when I used to run Enterprise Routing globally and and got to see you at every Cisco Live, in, whether it was in Europe or down in Melbourne, which is also one of my favorite spots to go. Um, we always had a, a great partnership and spread the word. And, and finding someone that shares the same passion around DevOps and what we can do with it was uh, was wonderful. And then the other person is is Susie Wee. I mean, Susie. To, to take something that was so nascent and build it out to where it is. And, uh, you know, there's no charge for this stuff. You know, you go on and you can learn this and, and have this all exposed and really to change the way Cisco goes to market is incredible. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, the whole, the whole you know, whether it's, it's Julio or John um, or Patrick or you, I just, the whole DevNet team has been awesome to work with and, and so supportive of the partners and everybody in the channel. I know that all the partners love everything you guys are doing for us. And so I just want to say thank you to the whole team. And on that note, we'll uh, say thank you to our audience for tuning in. And of course, to everyone who was part of today's show. My message for everyone is to quote what really all of you have said in this past hour, be the person with that passion. That's what the world needs. Thank you.